we'll start today's um, lecture with um, a small recap of what we were discussing last time. Um, and then we'll uh, dwell into two of the major players um, of the endomembrane system today. We're going to look at the um, endoplasmic reticulum and we are going to try and look at the um, uh, Golgi, right? And see how they are assembled um, and what we know about it. These are very interesting systems. The endomembrane system, as I mentioned earlier, uh, is a system that's put in place, um, which uh, connects uh, the protein synthesis machinery at one end um, to the delivery of uh, processing and delivery of proteins uh, to different parts of the cell, including uh, the plasma membrane. And the fact that the plasma membrane is made up of lipids, um, you know, this network uh, is also made up of lipid membranes um, and uh, that allows for proteins um, to travel in a milieu of lipids, uh, to be modified, functionalized um, in this milieu of lipids, because eventually they have to function um, in a milieu of lipids, right? So, so that's the delivery uh, mechanism uh, you know, that these endomembrane systems, um, uh, you know, allow for. Um, and starting from the nuclear um, nucleus, uh, you know, the first component of the endomembrane system uh, is the uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum, which is where um, a large amount of the protein synthesis happens uh, because of ribosomes that are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum, which then transitions um, into a smooth endoplasmic reticulum where the density of uh, these ribosomes is reduced. Uh, this is more uh, where the packaging um, of these um, proteins that have been synthesized in the rough endoplasmic reticulum happens um, and then stuff deliver, gets delivered to the Golgi. So it's these three components that we're going to look at today. Um, and, and we looked at, uh, or we briefly talked about the endomembrane system and how the endomembrane system is put together um, and how these vesicles are transported from one compartment to the other. Uh, we also spoke a little bit about the fact that um, uh, the, uh, the composition processing capability of each of these components could be different. Right. So when we look at the uh, Golgi, for example, we'll talk about how uh, there are different enzymes that could be present in different Golgi compartments um, and how uh, proteins, for example, uh, can be modified as they make it through these compartments as well. Right. Um, the endomembrane system, um, as I said, begins from the nucleus, uh, you know, to the smooth rough and the smooth ER, the Golgi, and then um, all the vesicles, the transport vesicles that deliver stuff to the plasma membrane um, and other sites inside the cell, right? Uh, the endoplasmic reticulum accounts for um, half the membranes in a eukaryotic cell. And this is um, an interesting point to remember that, um, you know, when you see uh, diagrams in uh, textbooks, the endoplasmic reticulum uh, is presented as a sheet uh, around uh, the nucleus. Uh, but remember, this is distributed throughout the cell. And I'll show you some images that we have taken in the lab later as well, um, that shows you how you know, extensively distributed this network is. So it's a mesh almost. Right, like the uh, cytoskeletal network is present throughout the cell, the endoplasmic reticulum also uh, is present pretty much throughout the cell. Um, it includes membranous tubules um, and an internal fluid will spaces, which are called the cisternae. The ER membrane is continuous with the nuclear envelope. So, uh, you know, if you ever get asked whether the nucleus and the ER talk to each other, uh, the answer is yes, and that happens at the level of their membranes. Um, and the cisternal space of the ER is in con in continuous is continuous with the space between the two membranes of the nuclear envelope. Uh, this also allows uh, for, um, you know, the initial steps of, uh, you know, protein synthesis that have to be facilitated on the ribosomes uh, to happen on the uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, there are, as I said, two kinds of um, endoplasmic reticulum, um, and rough and smooth is just um, on the basis of the texture that they have. Um, and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum looks smooth because it lacks ribosomes, and the rough endoplasmic reticulum um, looks rough because uh, ribosomes are bound to the membrane of this architecture, right? So the ribosomes sit on the uh, on this membrane, and you can see this image here where you can see these tiny dots, which are the ribosomes that are present on the membrane. Um, and if you remember the movie, The Inner Life of the Cell, 
um, you know, you, you will remember that uh, uh, there is this image um, of a ribosome synthesizing a protein that then gets integrated into the membrane, right? Um, and, um, and that's what's happening here um, on the uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum is rich in enzymes and plays a role uh, in a variety of metabolic processes. Enzymes of smooth endoplasmic reticulum synthesize lipids, including oils, phospholipids, and steroids. Uh, these include uh, many hormones. Uh, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum also catalyzes a key step in the mobilization of glucose from stored glycogen in the liver. An enzyme removes the phosphate group from glucose phosphate, a product of glycogen hydro hydrolysis, permitting glucose to exit the cell. So this is just to illustrate the fact that there are many things that are happening um, at the level of the um, smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Um, as I said, the synthesis of um, uh, lipids is rather important uh, because a lot of the milieu in the cell is um, made up of lipids. Um, a lot of the uh, reactions that are taking place, interactions that are taking place are happening on lipids. Um, and so uh, the lipid architecture composition of the cell um, is vital to the functioning of the cell. Um, and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is contributing very directly to that. Um, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, as we just talked about, um, is, is uh, you know, uh, rich in ribosomes. Um, and so uh, it's the site where the synthesis is taking place, right? So these are the protein factories um, of the cell. Um, and uh, once the protein is synthesized, the fact that the ribosomes are sitting on a membrane allows for the protein to then now directly be passed on to the membrane, right? And that's an important um, step in this process because uh, the movement of these proteins, right, um, from uh, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, their packaging and processing in the smooth uh, endoplasmic reticulum, delivery to the Golgi, processing in the Golgi, all of this is happening on the membrane, right? So the ability of the protein to be made and integrated into the membrane uh, is very vital, right? Another important point that we spoke about last time is the fact that the eventual delivery of these vesicles, um, you know, where the protein is presented to the plasma membrane, uh, requires for these vesicles to open inside out, right? Which means if the protein, if this is the protein and, and that's the top and the inside and in the cell membrane, this is how the protein has to be presented, right? Where this is outside and this is inside the cell, then in the vesicle, this has to be inverted, right? So in the vesicle, the um, you know the head of the protein, uh, you know, in this case, for example, the receptor should be inside. So eventually, when it gets delivered and fuses with the plasma membrane, the orientation becomes the way it is, right? So, so this is also interesting uh, point to remember that uh, the proteins that are being synthesized and integrated uh, into the uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum. Remember uh, that that synthesis uh, accounts for this and ensures that the protein integration happens in, in this orientation, right? Such that their eventual functional orientation uh, is like this, right? And, and that's an important um, element to how synthesis and integration is taking place. As I said, it's the, um, the rough end endoplasmic reticulum is also the place where membranes are being made uh, and membrane bound proteins are synthesized directly in that membrane. Enzymes in the rough endoplasmic reticulum also synthesize phospholipids uh, uh, that are uh, from pre precursors in the cytosol. As the endoplasmic mem membrane expands, parts can be transferred as vesicles to other components of the endomembrane system. And that includes the smooth endoplasmic reticulum and from the smooth endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi. We are not spending a lot of time discussing the mechanism of this delivery um, because you are just trying to kind of scratch the surface and understand that there is a series of steps here. Um, you know, at a later point of time, you will read about uh, the delivery mechanism and, and there are very intricate, uh, you know, proteins that are required for taking a vesicle and ensuring it gets delivered to a very specific site in the next compartment, right? Um, and so, so stuff gets moved along from one, it's like a conveyor belt, right? It goes from uh, one compartment to the next, to the next, to the next, um, and eventually to the site uh, where it needs to be functioned. 
function. The, the rough endoplasmic reticulum's architecture has very interesting, um, you know, has now, we've had some very interesting insights and there is, um, uh, you know, this very interesting paper that was published a few years ago that essentially said um, that the architecture of the uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum um, could have this parking garage model, right? And I don't, you know, if you've used a parking garage, you know how you're able to kind of move up the parking garage, uh, you know, in, in this manner. Um, and, and that arrangement allows for things to be moved around at the same time, optimizing the area um, of the endoplasmic reticulum, right? So, so it's packed very interestingly, um, you know, and this is known about the rough endoplasmic reticulum, uh, whether the Golgi has a similar architecture, we at this point of time don't know. Um, and this was a very seminal paper that um, essentially looked at um, and modeled, um, you know, used um, uh, e EM images uh, to model the architecture that the rough endoplasmic reticulum, reticulum could have. So this is an interesting arrangement to allow for um, processing to take place and also for things to get carried along, right? Um, as I said, the synthesis of uh, proteins happens, uh, you know, through ribosomes on this uh, compartment. Um, and, and we spoke about this as well, uh, you know, when we looked at the inner life of the cell uh, movie where, uh, you know, ribosomes come and attach to the uh, ER membrane um, and proteins could be synthesized either into the lumen or integrated into the plasma membrane. It depends on what kind of protein you're trying to make. Um, and, um, you know, the mechanism of protein synthesis is not something that we are covering at this point here. So all you are, need to understand from this is that uh, the ribosome comes and attaches to the ER um, and spends time on the ER and allows for synthesis uh, of proteins that either get secreted inside or get integrated into the plasma membrane. Both possible scenarios exist, right? Um, these, for example, are images uh, taken in the lab where uh, we are staining for um, an ER marker um, called uh, KDEL um, and the Golgi is labeled uh, with a marker called GM130 um, and uh, the Golgi is in green, the ER is in red um, and the point that I wanted to make more than anything else is that um, even though the images that we, uh, we, you know, we run into uh, show the ER as being this small network of membranes around the, um, around the, gall uh, around the nucleus, uh, remember that the uh, ER is essentially spread throughout the cell. Right, So the ribosomes and the rough ER is closer to the nucleus. This big empty space that you see in the center is actually the nucleus. And so the Golgi is sitting right next to the nucleus. So you now know that depending upon where the Golgi is sitting, you also know that the microtubule organizing center is supposed to be somewhere there, right? So the microtubules uh, are likely to be present in that particular region around the Golgi. Um, and uh, what is um, interesting is how the ER is distributed throughout the cell, right? And, and it goes to all corners uh, of the cell. And so now there is um, a far greater understanding of what the ER could do by itself as well, right? And um, for a long time, we thought uh, everything that the ER does needs to go through the Golgi or other compartments. And it's possible that that need not always be the case. Right? Um, and so there could be um, a role for ER uh, in the way it is distributed here as well. Um, the Golgi apparatus, which comes, which lies right next to the ER and, and does a significant part of the processing, essentially finishes the protein, right? And when I say finishing, uh, it's like, um, you know, it gets the protein in a crude form. Uh, it looks at the protein from all sides, you know, decides what else needs to be attached to it, uh, right? Modifies it in that way uh, that allows for the protein to now be fully functional um, and then sends the protein on its way. Right. So um, transport vesicles from the ER, um, you know, carry components to the Golgi. Right. So remember the um, that uh, these are big bags of uh, lipid uh, that have proteins either inside or on their membrane and they come and stick to the Golgi compartment. And now, uh, you know, the Golgi takes up these components um, and now processes them. Right. Um, it's uh, so the architecture of the Golgi and the way the Golgi is assembled is very vital to how this processing takes place. Right. So if you change the architecture of the Golgi, you dramatically change uh, the way proteins are being processed. And the Golgi is 
constantly working right so in cells in our body now at any given point of time uh, for example as we are all trying to pay attention in class and 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 focus uh, you know your your the neurons in your brain are constantly firing right um, and there is um, modification of proteins delivery of proteins uh, to synaptic vesicles through synaptic vesicles through the synapse all of this is happening as we speak right and it's a continuous process and the golgi is very vital in mediating this um so it has um a stack of lipids right and as i showed you with the er we don't know whether the golgi stack also has this uh, you know parking lot appearance it's possible that it does uh, because one of the challenges has been uh, in being able to open the golgi and look at it right uh, so the er at least has a fairly opened up architecture the uh, golgi is a more compact structure um, and it is a stack of uh, membranes one above the other right and and that's meant that you know it it'll be really nice if we can hold and somehow pull the golgi apart and then start looking at how these membranes are all connected it's thought that these membranes uh, or you know these parathas that are lined one above the other um are um, uh, are connected uh, you know by uh, you know membrane connections so it's not like they are kind of separate from each other um and uh, the presence of these connections the architecture of that connection if any uh, is still not clear to us right uh, the golgi again has very distinct even though it is one structure it has um, a very distinct uh, you know architecture inside it you know it's like uh, we have a campus of icer all of the stuff that is inside the campus is icer but within that campus you have different uh, you know buildings that do different things um, and and that's kind of the distinction that we have so externally all of these membranes make up the golgi but if you look carefully depending upon the kind of um, enzymes that are present uh, there is some classification that is taking place right the important thing to consider here is this classification uh, could be fluid uh, you know that uh, there are three major golgi compartments the cis medial the trans golgi and then there is something called the trans golgi network which kind of is from where vesicles are uh, are budded off and taken out right um, and um, this cis medial trans compartments their boundaries are a bit fluid right so remember yes uh, this might be the cis compartment this is where the uh, medial compartment begins but is there a you know a boundary that is always very sharp no this boundary is kind of getting mixed so there is cis 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 and then cis medial cis medial stuff coming in and then medial 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 right and so um, and that's how this architecture is arranged remember um, there is a you know this is a fairly fluid structure um, and is not uh, very rigid uh, the separation of these enzymes and that's an interesting thing right there are i told you there are proteins and enzymes that are uniquely cis and there are proteins and enzymes that are uniquely medial and then those that are uniquely trans um, and it's thought that um, the organization the membrane lipid organization of these compartments is what's allowing for some uh, enzymes to be enriched and kept in one compartment and some to be kept in the other right so um the enzymes could have a tendency to move from one compartment to the other but the fact that you know uh, that's difficult for them to do because of the architecture of the or the, the lipids that are present is what ensures that they they are enriched in one compartment uh, you know versus the other so this for example is an image that is taken in my lab uh, where we are looking at this gm130 and you are looking at the golgi stack in a cell that is adherent right and and you can see this is one marker called gm130 which actually marks the cis golgi um i'll show you some images where we have uh, we looked at the cis and the trans golgi and in the when the cell is adherent the cis and the trans compartments are right next to each other and there are some unique circumstances right where the architecture of the golgi undergoes change where you can actually see these two compartments uh, you know separated from each other um this is again um, a cis golgi compartment that's uh, you know uh, in a cell these are images uh, taken using a confocal microscope and if you remember i uh, when we talked about microscopy we talked about taking sections and then putting them together and that's what we've done so these are like these bread slices that were sliced and then each image was taken and then 
a composite uh, image was created, right? Um, and you can see that there are gaps in the architecture. You can see that these are indeed tubular structures. And remember, there is a certain resolution that the microscope allows, which is why you can see these uh, architecture, the, the, see this architecture the way you do. Um, you go to an electron microscope, you will see a significant number of, you know, membranes that are put together in each of these stacks that you are seeing here, right? Um, and, and that's how uh, things uh, look, you know, and the way they are organized. It's essentially, you know, membrane upon membrane upon membrane. Um, and, uh, you know, stuff coming in from one end, uh, you know, from the ER, and then leaving at the other end after it has gone through all these compartments, right, um, and has been processed accordingly. Um, among the things during this transit from the cis to the trans uh, end of the Golgi, Things that come from the ER are modified, as I said, and reach their kind of final functional state. Among the modifications um, are uh, addition of these sugars, oligosaccharides, um, you know, which are added to proteins to particularly make uh, glycoproteins, which are, you know, sugar modified proteins. Um, and the glycosylation of proteins is one of the major changes. With time, now we have understood that many proteins carry glycosylation changes. And these glycosylation changes are very vital to the functionality of these proteins. So two things that the Golgi accomplishes is one, uh, changing or modifying the protein in such a way that the functionality of the protein is optimized. And second, also ensuring that it has all the pieces that are required to deliver uh, the protein to very specific sites in, inside the cell. The Golgi can also manufacture its own macromolecules, including pectin and other non-cellulose polysaccharides. During processing, material is moved from cisternae to cisternae. So each of those parathas is a cisternae. Okay, and, and these are uh, essentially an elongated sac of, uh, of a lipid membrane uh, and, and things move from one cisternate to the other. And there are different models uh, that are thought to describe, you know, how this movement can take place. You know, one model suggests that uh, things leave from this compartment and just fuse with the next compartment and then go through, fuse this one and then fuse to the next and then just go through. Uh, one model suggests that no, no, you know, from this cisternae to this cisternae, if you have to move, a vesicle comes out of it and then, you know, goes and binds here. Uh, and then from here to the next, and then from there to the next. We still clearly don't know uh, entirely how uh, or which model is actually uh, the model that the cells use. Is it possible that they use more than one mechanism to do it, uh, to do this, uh, you know, moving forward of um, the cargo? Uh, it's possible, right? So the Golgi tags, sorts, and packages materials into transport vesicles. And now, like, you know, envelopes or letters that carry, uh, you know, content in them, uh, these vesicles uh, are sent out um, and, and, you know, they go bind things as they are required to bind and then um, are delivered to very specific components inside the cell. Uh, a lot of this um, architecture of the Golgi, as I said, is maintained by the cytoskeleton. Uh, so this is the kind of movement that we are talking about. Um, and uh, you know that the Golgi compartment uh, sits around the MTOC. So a lot of the microtubules um, are in very close proximity and contact with the Golgi. Uh, they are actually important for this kind of architecture, the nice packed architecture of the Golgi to also be maintained. So a lot of the microtubules are kind of holding the Golgi uh, around. Um, and just as a matter of information, I'm telling you that there are many, um, uh, you know, Golgi uh, compartments uh, that actually bind motor proteins, right? And so the motor proteins that are touching and walking on the um, uh, microtubules are in turn attached to Golgi membranes, right? And so the relative movement of these motor proteins also ensure that the Golgi compartment is kept where it is. Um, and there are times where the Golgi actually has to get broken up. And one very uh, interesting time uh, is uh, when the cell undergoes division. Okay, And at the very end uh, of our lecture series, we will look at the cell process of cell division briefly to kind of highlight all these players in the context of cell division. And cell division is interesting because as the cell divides, this Golgi, which is a nice compact packed structure, has to get distributed between the two daughter cells. Right. Um, and the way it does it is that the Golgi actually breaks up. 
right? So everything that is kind of keeping the Golgi together, the microtubules, the motor proteins, all get rearranged during cell division. And when that happens, uh, there are other proteins that are required for Golgi architecture that also come into play. Um, and what they eventually do is that they allow for the Golgi to break up. And the Golgi actually distributes throughout the cell, completely breaks up and distributes throughout the cell. And then now the cell divides. And once the cell divides, you know, pieces of Golgi here, pieces of Golgi here. Um, and once the division is complete and the cell attaches and spreads, right? This Golgi pieces that were all floating around along the microtubules are brought back into a compact Golgi for this cell and this cell, right? And it's a really wonderful mechanism that um, the endomembrane system, along with all the other players that are in the cell, uh, is able to work and do this. Um, and this, uh, you know, mechanism of the breakup of the Golgi, uh, you know, we study in the lab. Um, and I'm just showing you some images um, of the Golgi in a cell that is actually detached, right? So when I told you that during cell division, the cell actually rounds up, right? Uh, and because the cell rounds up, uh, you know, the, our hypothesis was that that could trigger the Golgi to break up. And that's what we see that, uh, you know, when you take a cell um, and, and detach it, uh, you can see the Golgi, uh, which is here, we are looking at the trans Golgi, the Golgi is actually broken up and, you know, distributed throughout the cell. If I take this cell and now plate it on back on matrix and the cell attaches and it is just attached, it is still round, right? The Golgi goes and becomes a compact structure. And this taking apart and coming back happens along the microtubules, okay? And it is dependent on motor proteins. The way these images are taken is again, these are confocal images, these are stacks, which are then processed using a very special software that does something called deconvolution. And then they are surface rendered. So you can see these shiny objects because of the way the images have been processed, right? But they all are actually originally images that are taken on the confocal stacks that are then kind of put together and then processed further, right? Um, the architecture of the cytoskeleton in these cells that are detached uh, is still, you know, I told you this moves uh, out and in along the microtubules. Um, and you can see that architecture is, uh, is pretty much retained. It's a mesh, even though these are suspended cells. There's big hollow structures are actually the nucleus uh, in, the, in the cell, right? Another very interesting facet about the Golgi that has been discovered in the last maybe five or 10 years is that uh, the Golgi sits around the end centrosome, right? So the centrosome is where the microtubules are originating. But now there is enough evidence to suggest that the Golgi could also act as a place from where microtubules can originate, okay? So um, there are a class of microtubules that are Golgi nucleated microtubules. That is, they originate from the Golgi. And this is another role that the Golgi is now known to be playing, which, you know, the Golgi was discovered so many, many years ago. It's only now five years ago that we identified it has this capability as well. So there could be other things the Golgi does that we don't fully understand and will take time for us to also, uh, you know, discover. As I said, the processing of the Golgi, uh, you know, this movement of vesicles that are happening, uh, you know, and, and along with the fact that the vesicles can move in the front, there is thought that the vesicles can also go backwards, right? So there is um, a movement forward and a movement backward, and that keeps the balance of how proteins are being processed. And depending upon uh, you know, how these movements are regulated, the way uh, processing takes place uh, changes. Remember one important thing, that a time a protein spends inside the Golgi uh, in each compartment has some influence on the uh, architecture of the protein eventually, right? And one of these major changes that proteins undergo is the addition of these polysaccharides, right? And I'm just showing you an example of a protein um, that as it moves from the ER to the luminal ER to the cis Golgi to the medial to the trans Golgi, uh, these, uh, you know, blue and green dots that you see are different sugars that get added to the, to the protein, right? Um, and, and that's the final protein that comes out has a very elaborate, uh, you know, sugar signature. Um, and that sugar signature is very vital to, you know, where the protein is targeted and how it functions. Um, and this just gives you a flavor of how movement through these compartments 
each individual sugar unit gets added and these additions are mediated by uh, by you know enzymes that are sitting in each of these compartments and the time that a protein spends in a compartment in the presence of an enzyme is going to determine how that modification takes place and how well it may it is made now imagine a protein has to go through all these compartments and come out in a fully functional form these little things have all have to work well right um, and ensure that all the changes that are required are taking place such that the protein now gets delivered in a particular form the change in the sugar composition of that uh, you know sugar uh, modification of the protein can affect the localization and the functionality of the protein so uh, the cell can at times use this processing machinery to change how the protein functions and where it works okay and that's also a remarkable uh, you know thought here this is the uh, mechanism uh, of processing and as i said along with uh, the golgi and the er you know through secretory vesicles things are carried to the plasma membrane um, and then you know there are early endosomes late endosomes lysosomes that we will talk about next time which are all different components and things from the uh, you know golgi can get uh, you know, move to one or more of these compartments. And these compartments can also talk to other compartments that are present there, right? But remember, all these are lipid filled sacs. Um, and, and they, you know, they have vesicles that come and uh, stick to them, fuse with them, do things with them, and then vesicles that pinch off and go, right? And these vesicles are really interesting structures, right? And um, this is actually, I, I just wanted to show you this because, um, you know, it gives you a sense of how uh, you know, what is the kind of crowding that a vesicle can expect? This is a synaptic vesicle, right? Um, and uh, this is a synaptic vesicle with all the different proteins that it could carry, right? It's a model. These are not real images, but the proteins uh, that are put on them, you know, are, are real because that's the architecture of the protein. Uh, you can see a cross section of that vesicle and you can see there are some proteins that are transmembrane, some that are only on the outside. But look at the kind of crowding that a synaptic vesicle could have. Um, this image C here is uh, containing one particular, uh, you, you know, uh, protein that is distributed on the vesicle, which is synaptobrevin, right? Um, and so if you look at one protein, you know, and its conformations that pres that are present on the vesicle, and then now all the other proteins that are come to that are that are brought in, and and these synaptic vesicles are what move along neurons, right, and re reach synaptic vesicles and are uh, delivered to do uh, you know to to communicate, create communications between two synaptic vesicles. Look at the density of things that are on the vesicle, and it's important to keep that in mind because you are imagining a vesicle. You should not be thinking this has three proteins on it. Mm -hmm. Very unlikely. Okay, um, I'm going to play a small part of this uh, inner life of a cell, which is um, a new video that was made a couple of years ago, which is a modification of what they had earlier. And I'm only playing that portion where they talk about a vesicle um, and how a vesicle is um, looks. The things that I want you to pay attention to is, of course, the vesicle and what the components are. Again, remember how this is all moving around uh, in the cytosol uh, in the cell. You will see microtubules, you will see motor proteins as they are walking with a vesicle, uh, you know, along the microtubules. Um, look at the crowding, the density of things, right, inside the cell as well. So remember, uh, you know, the, the ER, uh, the Golgi, the vesicle compartments that are talking to each other, the microtubules, the centrosomes, all this is packed into a very, um, is in a very dense manner inside the cell. Um, and still they are all able to talk to each other, communicate and function, ideally to allow for the cell to do what it needs to do at every given point of time. Okay, so, so let, let's listen in here. Donation, secreted proteins, membrane proteins, and proteins targeted to intracellular organelles. For example, vesicles destined to late endosomes are formed at the surface of Golgi stacks. With the help of platform molecules that assemble into a coat, promoting the curvature of the Golgi membrane. Shortly after their release, the vesicles shed their clathrin coat and adapter proteins. 
synaptic vesicles undertake a long journey along axons. To overcome limited diffusion caused by molecular crowding, motor proteins transport vesicles on long fibrous proteins called microtubules. Few kinesin motors move each synaptic vesicle toward the plus end of microtubules. Free kinesin adopts an inactive folded conformation. Upon binding with the vesicle, the kinesin stalk region unfolds, and the two kinesin heads are free to interact with the microtubule. The ATP-dependent switch between microtubule-bound and free states leads to the alternating swing of the heads that characterizes the hand-over-hand -hand walk of kinesin. Conformational changes and electrostatic steering promote unidirectional movements of vesicles. At any given time, one kinesin head is attached to a microtubule, thus favoring long-range uninterrupted vesicle transport. If a vesicle detaches, its very limited diffusion increases the probability for fast reattachment. In the crowded environment of the cell, mutations altering protein folding increase the risk of aggregate accumulations, which play a key role in the pathogenesis of many neurodegenerative diseases. So, so this movie is largely about, um, you know, talks about how um, neurodegenerative diseases are created. But this portion is interesting because of what we, uh, you know, what we just talked about in the last few lectures, right? So, so that's, um, you know, that kind of crowding, um, you know, despite uh, that, uh, the fact that these, uh, you know, architectures are maintained and, you um, uh, you know, transport and delivery to very specific sites in the, in, in the cell are being done uh, is, is truly wonderful and remarkable, uh, you know, if you consider that. <laughs>